Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. If you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch, Legacy of Monsters. Streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. Level up your listening with Bose Quiet Comfort Ultra Earbuds and Headphones with immersive sound and world class noise cancellation for a not so silent night. Visit Bose.com slash Spotify to shop sound that's more than a present. Hey, you are listening to Oh Crap Parenting with me, your host, Jamie Gorlacki. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F bomb a lot. Hey guys, welcome, welcome. So today I'm doing a follow-up episode for the tons of questions I got from my How I Eat and Train, a very long story. (laughs) First of all, I want to say thank you for all the feedback. That episode was so near and dear to my heart. And first of all, I had to go a second, first of all. (laughs) (laughs) I had to go back and listen to it. And I am going to talk slower this episode. (laughs) I'm having to go back and listen to a lot of my podcasts. And I cannot believe the rate at which I speak. And that you guys are even gleaning a little information from me. (laughs) So this is going to be another long podcast, but I am committed to not getting terribly excited and talking too fast and thinking that I have to cram it all in. And I will do as many follow-up episodes as we need to do to answer everybody's questions and keep this dialogue going. The feedback I got was incredible, probably more feedback than I've ever received for any podcast and incredible DMs and incredible emails with people telling me they started to jump rope or lift weights or, you know, gave up some processed food or stopped eating sugar and grain and immediately felt better. And I am thrilled that just my years and years of going down these nutritional, corporate, big food, big ag rabbit holes are serving you. And I couldn't be happier. And I cry every time I get one of your emails or DMs. I know I'm changing people's lives with my parenting coaching and with my potty training, but this is next level for me because you are the parent. You are the mom, largely. I I know some dads are listening. And so taking care of you, oh my God, it just makes my heart swell. With that, I want to jump in because there's a lot of information to cover, a lot of questions that people had, and I can't wait to hit them. So I wanted to start, since I just got back from the gym and I'm a little sweaty from doing my workout, I wanted to start with a question I got about moving your body and cardio because somebody had said, you know, you you didn't mention cardio. And I know I have a couple of patrons who are endurance runners, uh, you know, run races, marathons, ultra marathons, 100 mile races. So cardio, remember, I'm looking at this through a very specific lens. And I want to use this opportunity to remind you that this is how I eat. This is how I train. I'm looking at menopause. I'm looking at aging, which I think we all are headed in that direction. So it's wise to think of that. But that's where my focus is. And my focus is feeling really good in my body. And that takes many different shapes and forms as far as moving my body. Right now, for some reason, my back kind of feels stiff. My hips are stiff. So I'm doing just yoga. I'm doing a couple of yoga sessions a day. I'm walking. I'm doing some very light lifting. And I'm committed to doing that for a week because my body just feels not as pliable as it usually is. So you don't have to do what I'm saying. I'm not suggesting anybody do what I'm saying. And I want you to feel good. And I want you to question everything. And mostly I am so tired of the greenwashing of foods and things being called healthy and heart healthy and plant-based and and it's just processed garbage. So I'm just trying to bring awareness to that. Cardio is tricky. So cardio is a heart rate. Number one, first and foremost, it's actually a heart rate zone. And that's going to depend on your weight, your activity level, and your age what that particular heart rate zone is. So when we say cardio, people tend to think of elliptical machines, rowing, 
maybe um, running, a large amount of people consider it running, but it's not. You can get a cardio workout. You can work your heart. You can work your endurance. You can work your mental health by doing anything that gets your heart rate in that cardio zone. And that's training your heart. And cardio is good for those things. It's good for heart. It's good for mental health. And it's good for endurance training. It is not a great tool for weight management. And I want to veer off here for one second. I am not phrasing any of my past podcast or this podcast in a weight management frame, but I happen to know that for a large majority of women, that is an issue for them. I think I've said this numerous times, throw away your scale unless you are losing, you know, you're really trying to lose a huge amount of weight and it's, it's sort of vital to keep track of that. Other than that, it's such an arbitrary marker and it will fluctuate. And as you gain muscle, people say muscle weighs more than fat. Muscle just takes up less room than fat. And so if you look at what a pound of fat looks like and what a pound of muscle looks like, you can see fat is much fluffier and bigger. So, you know, five pounds of muscles and five pounds of fat weigh the same. Muscle doesn't weigh more than fat. But what will happen is you can, it's called body recomposition. And as you start to lift weights, your body will get toned and will appear to sort of shrink because the fat will go away and the muscle will get thicker and, and heavier. And so the scale can often go up but you could be losing inches and you could be feeling better and your joints could be in better condition. So I really can't say throwing away the scale was probably the best thing I ever did for my health because it really doesn't matter. And as women, I know that women get tied to these arbitrary numbers and the amount of women I have worked with and my old best friend would do this. Yeah, but I used to be 115 pounds and it turns out she was 115 pounds after breaking up with her first love and getting mono for six fucking months. So we do this. We keep the genes that we were in when we were depressed and had mono. <laughs> and we look at that weight and we keep a, a marker of weight, a number when we were not anywhere near our best, not to mention we were probably 17. <laughs> and, and we use that as a gauge. And it's so ridiculous. And I have seen time and time again, women, their bodies change, their health transforms, they feel amazing. And they start crying because that number, fucking number. So toss your scale. It is meaningless. While we're on meaningless markers and metrics, BMI, BMIs are ridiculous. They mean nothing. They're like a, a ratio that has no bearing on anything. And there are so many athletic women, myself included, when you know my legs are thick and muscular, technically on a BMI, historically I've been obese. That's what I register as with 17% body fat. So it's crazy. It's just these metrics aren't cool. And any doctor, I literally, I would say any doctor who, who uses BMI, just get a new doctor. <laughs> But I bring that up because cardio, there's different kinds of cardio, or I phrase it in different ways. So there's definitely people for whom it's your sport, like marathon runners, ultra marathon runners. And these runners typically do care about weight management because the lighter you are, the faster you are. And so if it's your sport and you're training, then that's in another category. I think there is cardio that is uh, really great for endurance. It's the cardio that I do, and it's the cardio I do pertaining to good health span. I, I hesitate to say longevity because I don't care about longevity. I care about my health span. And that has been proven to be sprints. That is the most effective cardio, short bursts, high interval training, hit training, that kind of thing. The one thing I'm really concerned about when we talk about cardio is the large majority of women that do chronic cardio for weight management. They are exhausting themselves. They're exhausting their adrenals and they are stressed out about getting their hour of cardio in because they, they want to burn X amount of calories or their fitness watch will read X, Y, and Z. And that's the thing I'm talking about when I want, when I say I want you to abandon cardio. Cardio doesn't send a muscle building signal. So, and in fact, if you look at marathon runners and if you look at ultra marathon runners, a lot of them are too lean and they also have some sarcopenia. If you look at their arms, their arms aren't necessarily very muscular. They're very, they're very thin and it can be muscle wasting if you don't attend to strength training in conjunction with your sport. And again, a lot of people don't want to do that because of the, the lighter they are, the faster they can go. So again, if this is your sport, I'm not stepping on your sport. We all do things kind of crazy. You know, when I'm in training for something, 
kind of all bets are off. I may eat and do different things when I'm training for something. But if you are the person who religiously gets on a treadmill, religiously gets on an elliptical or whatever, stair stepper, because this is in your head to keep your weight stable, remember that cardio burns calories in the moment. So if you burn 600 calories, good for you, but then you're done. That's it. You're done. And then strength building, building those big muscles, your glutes, your your quads, your hamstrings, those big muscle groups, those burn calories throughout the day. So metabolically, you're better off with muscle than you are with cardio. The other thing is cardio I've seen historically makes women hungrier. So you're like white knuckling it if you're trying to keep calories down while you're doing cardio. I also find with chronic cardio, people have exercise bulimia. They get very attached to calories burned and I ate X amount. I'm going to burn that off. That's not how it works. So don't, I see like really kind of disordered exercise around cardio more so than strength training. I think the great thing about strength training is it's really hard to track numbers and it's an immediate transformation. You start seeing muscles. I love muscles. <laughs> so you start seeing like, oh my God, look at me. Or you start noticing my kids feel lighter and I can like lift them up with, without hurting. And these benefits come very fast. I love sprinting because sprinting annihilates visceral fat. And visceral fat, remember, is that fat around your organs. It's that fat that is um, dangerous. That's the fat that is going to be responsible for cardiac events, right? It's not the subcutaneous fat, like the fat that we can grab, the outside fat. That fat can be hard on your joints, right? But it's the visceral fat we're really concerned about. And sprinting annihilates that. Sprinting is again, not just running. I hate to run. I only run for endurance. I do low heart rate training, which gets me at a jog, sometimes a run, but I keep my heart rate low. So the zones of heart rate is the below cardio is fat burning. And then there's sprinting. Sprinting for me is also a better return on investment. So if I can sprint 30 seconds and then rest 30 seconds and do eight rounds of that, I'm done in eight minutes. And as a busy mom who owns a business, I like that return on investment. This is how I think about sleep too. If for me, nothing good is coming out of my brain or mouth from eight to 11. So I might as well be sleeping and use those three hours for regenerating my body and then getting up early. If I get up at four, the work I do from four to seven, those three hours, the return on investment of my time is spectacular. So for me, that's how I weigh out things is like, What's the biggest bang for the least amount of buck? <laughs> and so that's what sprinting does. And sprinting is also great for uh, menopause and bone health. And, and again, that visceral fat. So those are my thoughts on cardio. Again, do what you want, but don't get stuck in the chronic cardio and don't get stuck. I'd really like to see women get off this literal and figurative uh, treadmill of just like, Got to, got to burn these calories, got to burn these calories because muscle will burn more calories throughout the day. So it's a better choice. All right, let's hit up some like quick kind of questions that people asked. Number one was, what's in your pantry? I'd love to know what's in your pantry. Okay, my pan- I don't have a pantry. I have a, one cupboard. My house is 600 square feet. My kitchen is 65 square feet. So I can be at my sink. I can reach my refrigerator and then take one step to the left and I'm at my stove. So (laughs) my kitchen's pretty small. I have one cupboard that I keep salts, condiments, uh, spices, maybe like hot chocolate, coffee, tea, those kinds of things. Um, Other than that, I have three deep freezers. So I repeat, I have a 600 square foot house, a 64 (laughs) square foot kitchen and three deep freezers. That is it. So (laughs) if that gives you an idea of my priorities, and that will play into a couple of other questions coming up. Somebody else asked, do you use any condiments or spices? I do. So many people go to, there's variations on being animal-based and one is carnivore, like strict carnivore. And the, the strictest version of carnivore is called the lion diet. And that is beef, salt, and water. That has proven to be very healing for mental disorders, depression, anxiety, bipolar. And it has been uh, very healing to figure out autoimmune stuff and to figure out what you're being sensitive to. So at its core, it's a great elimination diet. And a lot of people do that for 30 days or even 21 days, sort of clear the system, clear the inflammation, quiet your body so you can start to hear the signals. Then you add in food one at a time and you can say like, 
holy shit, I ate this. And suddenly I couldn't walk the next day. I had back pain. And a lot of people, it happens that fast. They'll introduce a new food and suddenly they're crippled with pain. And then you're like, I did not know that that was affecting me that way. Or the next day they may have seasonal allergies, did not, well, what they thought was seasonal allergies, right? So you definitely want to, um, that that's something you could try. The next level is carnivore and that is any animal based product. And that could be, um, cream, eggs, cheese, you know, pork, chicken, whatever, um, fish, any, any animal based. And so a lot of people do that because it's a wide variety and they'll do that without spices though, because a lot of spices, especially peppers, um, can be inflammatory. I have found myself to be sensitive to things like Um, cayenne, chili powder, black pepper, but I can have it once in a while. So if I make a chili, I can have a bowl, but I have to can the rest of it because if I eat it several days in a row, it's more like the cumulative effect bothers me. But I do use condiments and spices. I use primarily Primal Kitchen brand. That is uh, Mark Sisson, that guy I mentioned in the last podcast. That was his company and he sold it to Kraft they seem to have some integrity with the company thus far, <laughs> even though it's craft. So they make um, marinades, barbecue sauce, and I like their no sugar ketchup. They're the only no sugar ketchup I have found on the market. Most other quote unquote, no sugar ketchups have fake sugars in them. And I don't, I don't like fake sugars. And so that's the brand I use. And then I use mustard and plenty of salt. I am not sensitive to onions or Worcestershire sauce. And so those are often in my roasts for flavor. So that's how I handled that. Do you eat fruits? I will occasionally eat olives and avocados. And I will occasionally eat maybe a banana once in a while. Bananas don't seem to have any effect on me. They, I, I feel like they're really good. You know, when I'm training, they're a good source of carbohydrate. I don't even feel like it spikes my, my glucose. I do love apples when they're in season here in New England, and that's about it. I like, I love blueberries, but I got to be honest, I'm vain and they stain my teeth. And so, yeah, <laughs> that's, it. that's it. But bear, bear in mind, berries are low on the glycemic index, so berries are going to be your best fruit to eat. I think fruit has less anti-nutrients than vegetables, so a lot of people do carnivore with uh, fruit. And they do very well on that as a carbohydrate source. So I think it just depends on you and your body. But a lot of the fruit has been, you know, if you look at what an apple looked like 100 years ago, it's nowhere near. We've just crossbred. I don't even think it's like that. Like the genetically modified, it can be genetically modified quite naturally, but we bred them to be the sweetest they can be. And so they're big and they're sweet. Um, So that's I don't eat a lot of them. I just get hungrier. I can feel like a spike when I when I eat them. Is there any meat you don't eat? No, there isn't. Uh, and I will eat any bizarre meat if I'm in another country. I've eaten brains. I've eaten kidneys. Yeah, especially if it's in another country. I'm trying to learn how to cook more organs. I do eat liver and heart. I eat... Uh, salmon, oysters, shrimp, all kinds of seafood. I try, of course, I try to get not farm raised. I try to get wild caught. I am conscious of mercury. I don't eat conventional chicken and pork. I do eat pastured chicken and pork that I get from farms that I know. Pork and chicken are raised horribly. Like everybody's going after the cows, it seems like recently, but it's not cows, it's chicken and pork. So I just wouldn't eat conventional chicken and pork. I will eat it if I get it from a farm. I know, and I know that I know the animals. Um, Somebody said they were confused if I eat any veggies at all. And I I realized I was being confusing. (laughs) So just through trial and error, I have found that most vegetables bother me. Um, They kind of raw stuff rips up my gut. I do like iceberg lettuce. I call it crunchy water. I don't think it has any nutritional value. I'm not fooled, but occasionally I want that crunch. I'll do like ground beef on a bed of shredded iceberg lettuce with, um, I make my own mayonnaise and I'll do like mustard ketchup and chopped up pickles. And then I have like a big Mac bowl. (laughs) Um, So that's popular. I also do like cheeseburgers and iceberg lettuce wraps. So that satisfies a sort of watery crunch. I eat fermented vegetables. I am committed this winter to learning how to do that, but for now I buy it in jars. I love fermented seaweed and carrots. I like fermented beets, but that's pretty high sugar load. 
fermented foods are really, really good for your gut and your microbiome. So I am committed. I eat something fermented every day, usually a little bit with every meal. If you're going to start eating fermented vegetables, and that includes sauerkraut and kimchi, be, go slow. Have just like a tablespoon at a time because if your gut's not used to it, your gut can kind of like explode. You'll look pregnant and you'll feel the bacteria in your microbiome will go like it's having a New Year's Eve party. <laughs> you'll, you'll feel it. So go slow if you're just introducing uh, fermented foods. Um, somebody asked about recipes and cookbooks and meal planning. So I do not meal plan. I do not have cookbooks. But I'll say more about that in a minute. So for me, what I do, and again, this was over time and over experimentation, is if I want a recipe, I'll look something up. Sometimes if I'm looking for just something different, like I might see something on Instagram and I'll, oh, that looks good. So like the other day, we had a chicken crust pizza. So you take ground chicken, Parmesan cheese and egg and salt and garlic powder. You, you mix it up almost like tuna fish. I have my own, I can my own chicken and you know, you make a crust, you flatten it, you make a crust, you bake that, you take it out, you let it cool. And then you put your toppings on and it's really cool because you can hold the pizza slice with your hand. It's not messy like a cauliflower crust pizza can be sometimes. And so like that, like I'll, I'll do a recipe like that. But to be honest, my food prep goes into literally preparing food so that we can have easy meals. So for example, I spend a lot of time making my own bone broth. I make, right now I'm rendering a whole bunch of fat so that I get the fat off from the animals. They are visceral fat. And I render that down and then I can that so I have cooking fat. And if I need skincare products or anything like that, I can make a lot with lard or tallow. I have never found, I have now found a bread without seed oil for Pascal for buns and sandwiches. And so I make that. So that's time consuming. I do a lot of canning. I can meals for Pascal. So like he can eat way more carbohydrates than me. And he, you know, he's young, strapping, testosterone filled boy. So, um, you know, he can have rice and potatoes. So like I'll do burritos in a jar that he can just empty out and make a burrito bowl. So more of my time goes into prepping so that we have easy food. And one of the things I can is potatoes so that I can make him, I make him French fries fried in duck fat, or I'll make, um, you know, like if I have a stew or a roast, I just can have the potatoes uh, instantly. And so it's like fast food, right? So if we come home from a busy day, I have pot roast that's been canned. I have potatoes that have been canned. Boom. He's got a meal. So that's where I put my energy. I don't put it into recipes. and. I will say though, like if you guys wanted to start by giving up like processed food and trying to limit sugar and grains, I would suggest you follow like paleo. That's what you'd be looking for, for recipes and cookbooks. Back in the day, back the story when I was 40 and I healed my arthritis pain and I went primal and paleo, I got this book called Everyday Paleo and it's by Sarah Fragoso. And I would say that would be the number one cookbook I have used so consistently, super family-friendly recipes for the recipes that kids like, recipes that you have everything in your cupboard. You know, those recipes where they're like, you need the blood of a virgin and eye of newt. And you're like, I got to order that from Vietnam. It's like crazy, like some of these recipes. So I found Everyday Paleo by Sarah Fergoso to be amazing. And that's going to be um, not have sugar or grains. And she has kids and her kids, you know, there's pictures of her and her kids eating the food and stuff. And so that was my most useful. And she's got some treats and stuff in there too. I think that's a really good jumping off place. I also love the recipes off of Nom Nom Paleo. And that's just a website. I love Peak to Plate. I just found that website and that Annie is a registered dietitian and she's a, a big game hunter, a wild game hunter. And so all the recipes are like elk or deer or or mousse, but they can easily be made with beef or pork. And she has amazing spice blends. So I like to make my own spice blends like taco spices or sausage. I make my own sausage, you know, because everything's got crap in it. <laughs> and then if you do like to cook, if, if cooking's your jam and you really love it, um, Danielle Walker has an amazing story. She runs a company called Against All Grains, and she has beautiful cookbooks, beautiful food, um, she has quite a compelling story. I just find her to, her recipes to be super high maintenance. I don't have counter space. I don't devote that much time to food. <laughs> so 
so that's my, that's, um, but if you love it and you have that like beautiful kitchen with the huge granite counters and all the appliances, she might be your jam. Her stuff is amazing. And Maria Emmerich. Maria Emmerich is in the keto space. I don't necessarily love her. To me, she almost looks like she has an eating disorder, but she has this amazing protein lasagna that I love, uh, which is basically you make lasagna and you replace the noodles with deli turkey meat and nobody knows. It's crazy. It tastes like lasagna. It's very, very cheesy. So it's a treat for me, but I will get some of her recipes too. And generally speaking, uh, these days I don't buy a cookbook, but if I find I'm using somebody's website quite a lot, I look for a tip jar, like a PayPal tip jar, or I email them and say, hey, I don't need a cookbook, but can I give you 20 bucks, you know, that I would have paid for a cookbook? Um, so I do, you know, content for free. I'm, I'm very sensitive about that. <laughs> okay. What is your relationship with caffeine? Somebody asked me. Caffeine is my lover, my best friend, my confidant, my husband, the love of my life. I will never give it up. I have given it up before and the sun just doesn't shine. And so I know, and you can recite to me all the issues with caffeine and I don't care. So I love my coffee. I have a cup of coffee in the morning and I have a cup of coffee around noon. I cannot have caffeine after one. Caffeine has a very strong half-life and I will be awake. And I think that's an old person thing. I know caffeine is a plant. So if a lot of people are strict carnivore, give up caffeine. And caffeine can be made, you know, coffee beans can be produced in horrible conditions. So I do try to stick with fair trade or a caffeine source that I can source and know where it comes from. Somebody asked me about nuts. Nuts are botanically a fruit. Nutritionally, they're a legume. And I don't eat nuts. And in fact, I would say the biggest marker of my health, the biggest dial mover was giving up legumes and, and nuts. There are a couple of things wrong with nuts. Number one, how they're produced. So all the nuts in the U.S. are primarily grown in California. They're not an indigenous crop. And so the they use 50% of California's water. And if you look at water maps, California is in the deep red, which means they're hot. They use a lot of water. 50% of that goes to, goes to nut growing. And California has tons of wildfires and they're always on fire. So I think that's telling. I think if you don't know the source of your nuts, they come from third world countries, slave labor. And if you Google, um, you can pull this, these images up and they're horrific women shelling cashews. And these women are on slave conditions shelling cashews and they are, um, their hands are burned, almost like burned off because it's so acidic. Nutritionally speaking, I just, nuts have, are full of phytic acid. And so phytic acid, it leaches, it leaches enzymes and minerals out of your system. It really interferes with the enzymes that you need to digest food, particularly pepsin, which is, it helps break down protein in your stomach. Amylase, which also does that with starch, um, breaks down the starch in your stomach. It inhibits uh, trypsin, which is needed for protein digestion in the small intestine. And the phytic acids can also like bind to minerals and leach them out of your system. I know it's worth it to get a test to see where your mineral levels are because we're all really pretty low. And Minerals work so there, it gets so complicated that this is where I like to simplify my food because I just feel like eating animal based keeps most of this in order. But you know, like if you have too much copper, it'll bind to zinc. If you know, there's, uh, there's all these things. So you can get really granular with it. But my view is like stay away from the things that leach it out of your system. <laughs> okay. And last question was, uh, how is this affordable? And I think that is a really good question because in this day and age with the inflation, meat is really expensive in the markets right now. I mean, everything's really expensive right now. So how to make it affordable? And this ties into me with sustainability. So for me, and again, this wasn't a decision I came to yesterday by listening to one person's podcast. This has been over the years, and this has been experimenting and trying really hard to make ice cream work for me, <laughs> trying really hard to eat the rainbow and not being successful. Meat is my priority. And so I buy a cow, I buy a whole cow or a half a cow, depending on the freezer space I have, depending on what's available. And that comes out to when you buy a cow, they do hanging weight at the butcher and the hanging weight, it was three forty nine a pound. So that makes it not just affordable, but I know where my meat is coming from. And what happens also when we talk about cookbooks and recipes is I get a wide variety of cuts and I get to learn because I'll be like, I, what, I got like uh, some weird flank steak cut the other day and I was like, I have no idea what this is. 
I ended up Googling it, you know, found a great recipe and it was amazing. So I like doing that. But you can get quarter cows, you can get half cows, and you can get whole cows, usually at a butcher. I think you want to stick local. And local, if you live in a city, local doesn't have to be like around the block. Local could be, you know, if I'm in Rhode Island, local might be New York. Like that's pretty local considering the size of the U.S. So that's something you can think about. I also know that this is a priority for me and my health and my wellness. And so I make choices. And I know that there are people with three jobs struggling right now. I know I have been dead ass broke in my lifetime and I have always sourced my meat like this and I've saved because like all things, you know, if you can buy something in bulk, it's going to be cheaper, right? Than if you're buying it one off, we know like a four roll pack of toilet paper might be $3, you know, 16 rolls might be, you know, $5. Of course I'm quoting 1990 prices. (laughs) I think toilet paper costs a lot more now, but you get the point, right? You know, I'd be remiss if I if I didn't say this, we, we do make choices when it comes to prioritizing health. I live in a 60, a 600 square foot house. Uh, and I, I purposely did that. I wanted to minimize. I lived in a 2100 square foot uh, flat before this, and I was just filling space. And Pascal and I didn't need that space. And you have rooms, you got to fill them. You have an open floor concept, you got to fill it. You know, my truck is 2010. My car is a 2014. My phone is the iPhone 9. I don't buy clothes until I have holes in my clothes. <laughs> like I'm terrible about it. I buy good, you know, shoes for training. So I do think that we do make choices. And for me, that is an important choice. And I do save. I put money aside. It's an investment. Um, you know, the cat, the last cow I bought with the butcher fees came to $3,200, but that is going to feed us for a year and a half. That's going to last us a year and a half, including Maverick. So then I go for the grocery store for very few things. And that makes it affordable to me. And it, you know, even if it is more expensive than the way some people eat, to me, that is a priority that I've discovered this is what's best for my health. And I am not willing to compromise that. I'd rather walk around with the holes in my shoes and have good meat in my freezers. Let's move on to environmental concerns because a couple of people asked about this. Uh, one loving patron had commented she's a yogi. And she was struggling with, as a yogi, her premises do no harm. Very strict yogis apparently don't even eat vegetables because vegetables do have, they are sentient. They have feelings. We've tracked that. They respond to vocal tone and to uh, singing. And so I don't know if that's strict, but let's go on to environmental, how cows are treated and on those concerns, because I know that's a big one for some people. So the emissions, let's look at the emissions that cow cow burps, because everybody says cow farts, but it's really cow burps, that that is responsible for global warming. And that is the high impact on our environment. That is patently wrong. That is so wrong. And it's just sound bites being quoted. And I really challenge you to question that. And it's not too far. You don't have to look far at all. The Environmental Protection Agency puts out every year what percentage of the emissions are. And so here's the list of the emissions. Transportation is responsible for 27%. Electricity is 25%. Industry, which is making goods, is responsible for 24%. Commercial and residential is 13%. Agriculture is 11%. Animal agriculture is 3.7%. And beef is 2.1%. Land use, forestry, regenerative agriculture, is a 13% carbon sink. And that includes regenerative agriculture. So out of that list of emissions, beef is 2.1%. And you will see people skew these numbers, but that is directly from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. I think we saw during the pandemic when transportation was halted, we saw LA with no smog. We saw dolphins in the Venice canals. We saw incredible skies. Because transportation is fucking up the environment, not cow burps. But it's a lot easier to get emotional behind cows and that whole agenda than it is to stop driving or to stop flying. Yes? And so transportation is big. Electricity is big. I like my electricity, even though you guys are going to die. My tiny house, each room has one light bulb. My electric bill is $60. I know, that's ridiculous, right? (laughs) But it's still part of the the admissions, okay? So 
I beg you to get the real numbers on this and not just listen to sound bites. So environmentally, transportation, and that includes the transportation of your food. So I have a place in Costa Rica. I actually just sold it because of, I was like, I, I don't want to fly there. Like I don't want to contribute to that kind of carbon footprint. But if you saw how bananas were produced in Costa Rica, you would be astounded. Bananas are a completely manufactured product. And the amount of transportation that goes into the bananas that you see in the market is incredible. And so when we look at our food and we look at where it comes from, we have to factor in transportation. And I feel like that's really minimized. You know, I've had people who are plant-based have discussions with me and they say, well, that's not important. Okay, wherever you live, can you live without transportation? Like, could you get all your meals riding your bicycle? Like, could you do that? <laughs> because transportation is a bigger deal when we're talking about food, particularly when we start talking about processed food. And then when we look at industry, right? Industry also is industry with food. If you look at all the packaging in the market, all the packaging that goes into like, take a cereal box, you not only got the cereal that took wheat and made it, you know, took a grain and made it into that, that's industry. Then it's put in a plastic bag, which is made in industry. And then it's put in a cardboard box, which is industry. So, you know, the, the ramifications are sort of huge. Again, I'm taking part in this system as well. I'm not trying, one of the things I want to go through with this is I'm not presenting any sort of moral superiority, but I'm tired of other sides of the camp presenting a moral superiority and also just kind of presenting that we're all taking part and we all make our choices. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Regenerative agriculture is where it's at. So we need ruminant animals. We need their hooves and their weight to tamp down the soil. We need them grazing. And when you go to a regenerative farm, this means all systems are working together. What they do is they do rotational grazing. And so the animals will graze not on the same land. They won't strip the soil. The problem is with a lot of the agriculture, the plant agriculture, is we've gotten so greedy for certain crops. So like pea protein goes up my ass sideways. Pea protein is terrible for the gut, but also it's not a grandmother picking peas in her garden with a basket. This is a huge monocrop industry. And so that industry is um, wrecking the topsoil, right? Like it's not really good to grow one crop in one place over and over again. Even if you have a backyard garden, you know that, right? So, you know, we kind of have to source everything and pull it apart. And and I know this gets overwhelming, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> so I'm presenting you nuggets and maybe something strikes a chord, yeah? I, I know we're all taking part in the system. And that brings me to ethically, so what do you think about how, you know, feedlots, how animals are treated when you eat animals? And I want to bring up what this patron had asked me, she, you know, do no harm. A yogi's promise is to do no harm. We are all doing harm. <laughs> so it's a sad fact, but we are. There is no life without death, period. There is no food that is blood free. There is no food on the planet that is death free. Plants. Even in your backyard garden, you will have to use something to keep the, the pests at bay. You will have to kill off either the rabbits, the squirrels, the rats, the mice, the slugs, you know, not even the, the tiny nuisance bugs. It is impossible to grow plants without pesticides or organic or otherwise, yes. And you need blood. You need bone meal. You need manure. We need these things. So there is no, no food on the planet that is death free. When you grow huge crops like pea protein, wheat, corn, soy, and pea protein are the largest US crops. Those are grown on huge fields. There's no people working, not even migrant workers. They're big machines. When those machines roll through, thousands and thousands and thousands of small animals die. Now, I'm not playing bleeding heart for the small animals, but that wrecks the eco culture there. That wrecks the ecosystem. The birds then have nothing to feed on. Then the birds have to go somewhere. The bees have nowhere to go. We know the tragedy of the bees. Like we're fucked without bees and the bees are leaving because we're doing this mono cropping. So I bring it to awareness because there is no food without death. It, it just doesn't exist. Now, when we say that, again, I want to be very clear. I'm not coming from a place of moral superiority. I am recording this on a Mac computer with my iPhone in my hand. Both of these take cobalt batteries, uh, cobalt in the batteries. I 
have an electric uh, hybrid car because I thought it was a better choice. Now I learned that that battery is heavy on cobalt. Cobalt is 100% mined in the Congo with 100% human trafficked slaves. There's a great book that's being released um, January 31st. I will find out the name. I can't remember the name of it, but it's all about the cobalt mining in the Congo. So we are all taking part as humans. Unless you live in a cave, there is a cost to living. There is. And it's a terrible thing to have to look at, but we have to look at it with eyes wide open. My phone is made with slave labor, I'm sure. There is no ethically made smartphone. So if you have a smartphone, you are participating in an unfair culture. Yes? How do we deal with this? And I think what we do is we choose. We choose those hills we're going to die on. We choose to do the best we can, knowing that we are in a first world country. We are going to cause harm somewhere down the line. We try to minimize it while maintaining our sanity, because number one is first do no harm to me. And that doesn't give me an excuse to live guilt-free, but it does give me a lens to look through where I want to keep my body as healthy as possible, but I also want to keep my mind as healthy as possible. And if I get too strung out trying to save every single one of these pipelines of harm, I will go crazy as well. So I think we all try to balance it. Yes. I think the biggest thing that I don't like, and again, I'm not presenting this in myself, but I don't like a moral superiority that plant-based is better than animal-based because it's not. That food also comes at a cost and you can't minimize that cost or put blinders on about it. Now for me, the sustainability of cows, and I know not everybody can do this, but this is what my cow was was raised a mile away from me. My butcher is 15 miles away. So I've minimized transportation. I've minimized hands on my meat. I've minimized processing. My meat does not go through any industry. The butcher is there, just knives. Um, well, he has a saw, um, but there's not a factory there, you know? So for me, that's a choice I make. It makes it affordable, but it also makes it uh, very sustainable. You know, people say, well, the whole world can't eat like that. I don't know that that's true. I think if we shifted our focus... I think the nuance about sustainability are deep. They are not Twitter blurbs. They are not sound bites on Instagram. They are a very nuanced conversation and we have to dig in and find actual solutions. The thing I really don't like about blaming emissions on cow burps is it's the wrong argument. Could we figure out something about transportation? What could we do about electricity? Solar panels aren't great. They're made by the captured Muslims in China. Like everything, all these supposed, oh, we just need electric vehicles, but then we have the cobalt problem. What do we do with the batteries when they die? Because they're not recyclable. So I just don't think there are pat answers. And I think it causes us to look in the wrong direction. So one of the things I know that a lot of scientists really hate right now is the the fucking straws. So the sea turtles, the straws go in the sea turtles' nose. So everybody got on the bandwagon. You get paper straws everywhere now, or you bring your stainless steel straw. Do you know how many paper straws I see in a Vente Starbucks plastic cup? It's not the fucking straw. It's the, it's the cup. It's the plastic cup. Single-use plastic is wrecking the oceans. So it's like if we myopically focus on like, oh, save the sea turtles and the straws, you think you're doing something really great for the environment and you're not really making the bigger impact. And so that's part of my passion too. It's like, let's talk about the real solution. Giving up meat is not the real solution. Let's talk about the nuances. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from. Monarch Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. If you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch Legacy of Monsters, streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. Um, now, as far as how cows are treated, I, I want to go into that. Again, pork and chicken are worse. So I stay away from uh, conventional pork and chicken. Conventional beef is not as bad. So we know feedlots. We know feedlots. I'm sure you've seen images or heard like feedlots. Factory farming is terrible. But a lot of people are very confused and don't know farming. And I find that the more, the bigger the city you're in, the more removed you are from the food source and the more you don't understand animal husbandry and how this all works. So cows 
are ruminant animals. They have four stomachs. They can't live on grains. Ruminant animals cannot live on grains. It makes them fat and it makes their stomachs bloat. You would explode a cow if you fed it grain all the time. Every cow in the country is started on pasture with a small farmer. Every cow. Yeah. And on these smaller cows, dairy cows, the calves stay with the moms because the calves, it's just like breast milk. The more you milk, the more you get. So, you know, small farms on, you know, dairy cows, that is happening. And then what happens is your average small farmer has to sell their cow to the corporate feedlot. And that's your big corporations. That's your Tyson, um, you know, Purdue, all your big meat companies. Okay. Those are the guys who are making the profit, not the little farmer. Most ranchers now are starting to go direct to consumer so you can find a rancher fairly local to you and get your meat that way, which is what I highly suggest. I highly suggest supporting these local ranchers and as local as you can get instead of buying your meat in the market. Now, when that happens, you know, these cows are in the feedlot. The conditions vary. And I will say this. There are always outliers and assholes in any industry. I am a hunter. Every hunter I have ever met or come across is extremely knowledgeable, extremely ethical, knows more about the ecosystem than anybody, any vegan. (laughs) Yeah. And they are, uh, you know, utmost integrity. I know there are Yahoo asshole hunters. I know there are hunters who shoot for, for just antlers. I know there are hunters who leave game behind. I know there are antlers who, I mean, hunters who don't care about an ethical shot. There's going to be that in every industry. So I can't speak for every single feedlot, but I know that most feedlots have gone to the Temple Grandin way. Temple Grandin was, uh, it, I don't know if she died. I think she's still alive. Um, Claire Danes was in a wonderful documentary about her. You can look up. She's autistic and she, was, you know, always around farms that she could sense animals pain. And so she designed a way for animals to be in a feedlot where they could be sort of have a cush life up until their last moments where, you know, it wasn't stainless steel, the the floor is a little cushioned, so it's soft for the animal and, and that kind of thing. Animals, when they sense their death, when they sense fear, they have a secretion. I can't think of the name of it now. I'll, I'll pull it up for the show notes, but it releases this secretion into the blood and into the meat and it wrecks the meat. If you've ever gotten a piece of meat, you open it and it smells like really, really rank and you take it back to the butcher, the butcher will say, oh, that's the fear. So it doesn't behoove anybody, even these big corporate people to lose the meat of a 1200 pound animal. Likewise with the antibiotics, people will talk about the antibiotics in beef there are strict standards when a when a cow goes to slaughter, what levels of the antibiotics. We use antibiotics in animals the same way we do with people. Like we get sick, we use antibiotics. The cows can't go to slaughter if they have certain levels in them. And we constantly are told about the hormones, the hormones, the hormones. And people don't realize how much hormones are in everything. And just for an example, a four ounce or no, three ounce uh, portion of soy has 11 thousand two hundred and fifty nanograms of estrogen beef has 1.9 nanograms so these numbers get like wildly skewed in the media or we hear oh the hormones in beef so i'll just say that so a lot of these cows are not treated poorly because a, a sick depressed fearful animal the meat is gonna go bad and people will lose their profits i want us to care about the animal but Regardless, the corporations are going to care about their profit. Now, this is what makes cows and chicken production so disgusting. Nobody cares if you lose a fucking chicken. Nobody cares if they step on a chicken. So chickens are produced in a pretty horrific way conventionally, as is pork. And I think pork, because pigs, if you've ever worked with pigs, they're so obstinate that I think they just get abused because they're they're very obstinate creatures. If you've ever been to a 4-H fair, <laughs> like, pigs are crazy. Um, but I, I just wanted to straighten that out because I think people don't quite understand that these animals aren't being abused. It would wreck the profit line. And again, I want to care about the animal. Some people will say, you know, how can you even care about the animal and then you're going to eat it? Am I supposed to hate and abuse an animal because I'm going to eat it? I can love an animal and give thanks for the animal for giving its life so I can be strong and still love the animal. My dad said that. He said, the thing I don't like about 4-H is they name their cows and then they kill them. And I was like, why? The cow doesn't get a name just because we're going to slaughter the cow? I don't, 
I don't know. I don't understand that. <laughs> but I am a hunter and I will tell you so many people are confused about hunting and nature is brutal, guys. If we stop all animal production right now, we'd have a bunch of carcasses and it, there would be, uh, there's a hierarchy in nature and deer, people don't understand how deer die in nature. No, no animal lies down and dies a peaceful death in nature. They get eaten. They get eaten while they're alive. Deer get eaten by running coyotes and they take a bite out of them a step at a time. It's like a three hour death, bite by bite. Way better for my bow to shoot a well-placed arrow and that deer goes down. That is a pretty peaceful death. So peaceful that I told Pascal that when I'm ready to go, let's take a walk out in the field and you hit me from behind. That's how I would like to die. <laughs> All right. Oh my goodness, you guys, this is going to be long. So I hope you hang in there with me. All right, let's talk about cholesterol because somebody asked me about cholesterol and, oh, I did want to say one thing. I did want to say a couple of things about meat rotting in your gut. You'll often hear that like meat sits around, it's so heavy, it takes, you know, a week to process. We know this, meat is digested in two to three hours and the nutrients are in your body within four to five. The human stomach's pH level is 1.5 to 3.5. If you know how pH acidity levels are measured, that's highly acidic. Could we chew metal? we could digest it. And literally, if you Google this, every site will say, please don't eat metal. So <laughs> I find that funny that we had to say this. Um, another argument I hear with cows is that all the grain we produce goes to feeding cows. This is nonsense. Let's take a, an ear of corn, a stalk of corn. You get one ear, maybe two ears. You get one ear of corn. That corn gets off that ear and that goes into our food products. Everything else, what do you do with the stalk? What do you do with the silk? What do you do with the husk? That goes to the cow. So cows eat a lot of uh, stuff that humans can't. They also are on land that can't be used for, the soil's no good. Like my land is terrible. I can't grow any anything on my land, but I could raise a cow. So they are often able to be in, in foraging places and places where it's not suitable to grow plants. And people will say, again, about the grains, you know, that all the grains are going to the cows. And this is so simple. Literally go into your market, go into your next big market, go down the aisles, go down all the aisles and just look. Go down the bread aisle that is two-sided with rolls and bagels and English muffins and bread and pizza crust and tortillas. Go down that aisle. Now go down the cracker aisle. That is all your crackers, all your snack foods, your Triscuit, your Ritz, your multigrain, whatever, all your healthy, your crackers, your pretzels, your popcorn. Yeah. Now go down your cereal aisle. Again, two-sided, right? We haven't even gotten to snack foods. Let's go to granola and then Pop-Tarts and those kinds of things. Yeah. Then let's go down the snack food aisle. We got pretzels. We got goldfish, right? And then go to your, go to the meat aisle. And you tell me where the bulk of grains are going. Grains are subsidized. There's a lot of money in grain. They're cheap to produce, but there's a whole lot in the middle of the market that is all grains. So I just think that's the layman's kind of easy test is like, no guys, we have so many grain products. It's just unbelievable. Oh, you know what I forgot in the questions is what I, how I eat in a day. I'll do that after I do cholesterol. So somebody asked about cholesterol. Doesn't your cholesterol go through the roof? And this is going to be another rabbit hole. <laughs> so I will start my cholesterol story with my mom because cholesterol I find is one of the biggest big pharma takeovers. So before we go into anything, what you need to know about doctors and nutrition is doctors rarely take they take a few hours of nutrition, number one. Number two, when they get information and nutrition ties into pharmaceuticals very closely with things like cholesterol, okay? So when you get a study, studies are long time. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of stuff to go through. They're often pages and pages, 200 pages long. So then there's a summary at the, the last page. Maybe it's a page and a half. And that summary is what the doctor reads because your doctor does not have time, especially in America with our insurance scam that doctors are rushed, right? And so they don't have time to keep up on everything, especially a specialist who might be trying to keep up in their you know, their area, they can't keep up with everything. So they read these summaries. These summaries are largely summaries of studies done by the pharmaceutical company. And the this has been proven by people who go through the studies and then look at the summary. The summaries are slanted. So a lot of the information came out cholesterol and cholesterol medicine came into being around 1997 is when Lipitor 
first was introduced, um, Lipitor became the best-selling pharmaceutical of all time. So statin drugs are the best-selling pharmaceutical of all time. And that happens to be the same year that the FDA allowed targeted ads on television. Only the U.S. and New Zealand are allowed to advertise pharmaceuticals on television. And New Zealand is very strict about their rules, us less so. So whatever, I knew about cholesterol. It came into my scene when my mom had, uh, after her first bypass surgery, she had a dissecting aneurysm in her, her aorta. And she was, of course, the cardiologist put her on the statin because her cholesterol was quote unquote high. So she went on the cholesterol and then within a very short amount of time, I mean, she went on the statin and within a very short amount of time, she was exhibiting a decline. It was brain fog. She was kind of shaky. She just kind of was losing a lot of words. It kind of looked like a decline. We weren't sure of what variety and my mom's had several. So I just started kind of looking up the symptoms she was complaining about. And it turns out that those symptoms were symptoms of women on statins. So I was like, I, Ma, I don't think you should be on a statin. Look at this. And, you know, my mom said, you shouldn't believe the internet, Jamie. The internet can lie to you. <laughs> yes, mom, I'm aware. So, <laughs> so luckily what happened is her cardiologist retired and her next cardiologist happened to be the woman doctor who wrote the book about how bad statins are for women. Thank God. So this doctor was like, oh my God, I can't believe they have you on statins. Your cholesterol is fine. And so this woman reigned my mother a new one, took her off statins. My mother's you know, symptoms improved. Everything was great. And I was like, what the hell? How could this be? How can this one doctor have written the book about statins in women in the same freaking hospital, this other cardiologist just shoves Lipitor down my mother's throat? what is going on? So I go down the rabbit hole and I literally, it took so long to find, but I found the chart of the payout that doctors get from pharmaceutical companies. This particular cardiologist was making $350,000 a year from the pharmaceutical company for recommending stats. That was his little bonus. If you guys can even do a small dive, there's a television show uh, a series called Dope Sick, and it's the OxyContin story of um, the Sacklers and how they pushed OxyContin knowing it was addictive. I just beg of you to watch that to just get an inkling of the corruption that's going on with the pharmaceutical industry. And so cholesterol is one of them. So I preface it by saying what you know about cholesterol may be false. And there are so many doctors now literally go onto Amazon and check out cholesterol myths doctors and see the books that pull up and doctors are really speaking out about it. This is going to shock you. So when you, when you look at cholesterol, most people look at LDL, that's your uh, low density lipoproteins, your, and that's your quote unquote bad cholesterol. And then you have your HDL, which is your high density lipoproteins. And those are your quote unquote good. You want low LDL, you want high HDL, you want low triglycerides. So given that your triglycerides and your HDL are in normal range. There has never been a cardiac event associated with high LDL. I repeat, there has never been a cardiac event when all the other numbers are stable with high LDL. If that doesn't blow your mind, because my entire life, I was told that high cholesterol is causing all the heart attacks. Okay. It's not. <laughs> Now, there are various things within those numbers that can, and inflammation is the biggest marker. So if you're highly inflamed, right, and remember, greens and sugar cause inflammation, right, and your triglyceride to HDL ratio is super off. So that ratio should be two to one. So if your triglycerides are 100, your HDL should be uh, 50. That So it wants, you want a two to one ratio and you can look that up. There's calculators online. If that ratio is off, chances are you have insulin resistance, which is a metabolic disease, which is responsible for type 2 diabetes, which causes inflammation. If you're not seeing all the dots connecting, <laughs> I can't help you. So now why would your triglycerides be high? Because that's what happens to a lot of people. Their HDL might be fine, but their triglycerides might be high. You ready? Are you sitting down? a low protein, high carbohydrate diet. Yeah. Poorly managed diabetes, medicines like exogenous female hormones, liver damage from alcohol, underactive thyroid. Remember those oxalates from vegetables? All of this leads to metabolic damage, which is insulin resistance. And guys, this is front page Google. This isn't a rabbit hole. 
Okay. Your blood pressure, normal blood pressure is 120 over 80. A really good, um, you know, they consider, uh, Anything under 150 for triglycerides to be good. Anything above 150 is risky. Your HDL, they want, you know, they want pretty low, pretty, you know, 60 is pretty good. And then your LDL. So a lot of people say, oh, my LDL is like 126 or my total cholesterol is 200. And there are doctors speaking out now and they're like, no, that's fine. So high LDL when everything else is in order is actually protective against Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and dementia. These autoimmune diseases that they're calling diabetes type three now, and that they're in high prevalence. I don't remember old people having dementia the way they have it now. When you go into a nursing home, it's the, the dementia units and the Alzheimer's units, which are locked down, they're getting bigger and bigger. This is increasing because of this. So if, and if your cholesterol is too low, you're more at risk for those things. So it's, again, it's a complicated thing that I'm just kind of brushing over, but all by way of saying, no, I am not worried about my cholesterol. I do not have the typical brain fog that I'm seeing in women my age, you know, that we come to think is normal. Like, oh, 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 what's that? What's that word? You know, that thing that we see, you know, of course, occasionally. So I do think it's worth noting again that the pharmaceutical drug of statins is the highest profitable pharmaceutical. And I think that sort of tells it all. So I would beg of you, if you are dealing with quote unquote high cholesterol, check it out, check out some other resources, check out what other doctors are saying and, you know, decide for yourself. I'm not advising anybody. I'm not saying ignore your cholesterol, but that is what I have found. I also know that there are many, many carnivores on Instagram who post their labs all the time. One is called the thankful carnivore. He has eaten nothing but ground beef and bacon for three years, solved, got off 15 psychiatric meds. His labs are completely normal. So it's, you know, I think when we look at cholesterol and meat, we're looking at people who eat meat in conjunction with other shit. Yeah. And I think that can be as damaging as eating all the other shit without meat. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think the devil's in the processed food. I really do. And I think when it comes down to it, the devil is actually in the seed oils. And I think that's the, the, the fire. And then I don't think sugar is the devil. I think sugar throws gasoline on the fire, but I don't think sugar in and of itself, in its purest form, I think when we start looking at highly processed, highly palatable foods, we're not just talking about cane sugar. We're talking about high fructose corn syrup. Oh yeah, by the way, when you're going down the grain aisles, look at the candy aisle because every candy has seed oils and cornstarch. So you're looking at corn when you look at the candy aisle. But, you know, I think that we're looking at food dyes, we're looking at maltose, dextrose, high fructose corn syrup, all these things that are designed to hijack your brain and your taste buds. And so that I think is where the real metabolic damage comes in. One of the things... I wanted to mention Barbara Roberts, The Truth About Statins. That was my mom's cardiologist. Her book is available on Amazon. Two books that I found very, very helpful were Wheat Belly, and that's written by William Davis, who's a cardiologist, and Grain Brain by David Perlmutter, and just about what the inflammation of brains does to your brain. And, and you might notice how your brain is declining. <laughs> so I think it's good to stop that. <laughs> And then another really, it was really eye-opening to me was it's a, it's called The Vegetarian Myth and it's by a woman named Lair Keith, L-I-E-R-R-E. -E. And this woman was a hardcore vegan and she, for years, and she decided when she started even tracking her vegetables that she didn't want the transportation. She didn't want more hands and in, in industry in her vegetables. So she made a huge home garden and just realized the death that goes into gardening and, and it just made her rethink everything. She was like, wait a minute, there is no, there is no life without death. It's just a circle. All right. And then lastly, uh, okay. Oh yeah. I got time. It's not that long. I forgot to mention people wanted to know what I eat in a day and like how I eat and what it looks like in meal planning and pastel and all of that. So again, at the beginning of the last episode I did was like, where do you start? I would start with just giving up the junk. Like if you could just give up the processed food for the most part, again, I'm not dogmatic about anything. If I want a red bell pepper, I'm going to go have it with some guacamole and I love it. Is it going to be bad for my arthritis? If I have six of them, yes. If I have one once in a while, it's fine. If I have a Snickers bar and once in a while, it's fine. You can't have it every day and you can't have it. The biggest thing I 
Yes, I'm into health. Yes, I want you to feel bad. But boy, do I get fucking mad when corporations get one over on us. So that then, I'll tell you what, I smoked till I saw the Philip Morris trials. And I was like, you fuckers are going to lie about this. I'm done. I'm not giving you any more money. Literally, that's the thing that made me quit smoking. Not health, not my lungs, <laughs> not the environment. No, the fact that these people were going to lie, sit there and lie and tell me this is good for me, then no, I'm not giving you my money. And that's how I feel about food right now is the amount of greenwashing, the amount of quote unquote healthy and all this stuff that's not healthy just pisses me off. So that may not be your reason. <laughs> I realize I'm ridiculous. Um, and I realize this is overwhelming. So I would just start slow, pick a few things to give up. Make For me, I just have lines in the sand. It's seed oils for me is, is a top priority. Um, and then single-use plastics. That's my next priority. I will be dying of thirst in the Sahara before I would buy a bottled water. I just, I think that's what's clogging the ocean. That's the hill I'm going to die on. Again, I'll sit in my electric vehicle with a cobalt lithium battery on my iPhone eating a cashew, but that's the hill I'm going to die on. So we have to pick these things, I think, and, and move slowly. And again, recognize that everything I'm saying is years and years and years. But I think going paleo, emphasizing produce and protein and fat. I think it's more even than me. It's, it's animal fat. It's so satiating and it feels so good. Um, I told you I'm rendering some fat right now. And of course, cutting up the fat that on my hands, my freaking hands are soft as a baby bee's bottom. It's like so nice. So what a day of eating looks like for us. I wake up in the morning. Sometimes I like to just have a black cup of coffee and fast. I'm playing around with that because supposedly that's terrible for your hormones. I feel great. I am having no hormonal problems, but I am playing around with eating within a half hour of waking up. So there are these two conflicting theories. So I don't know who to believe. So I'm experimenting to see what works for me. Uh, so if I do eat in the morning, though, I don't want a meal. I usually eat raw liver. I've eaten raw liver every day for 20 years. <laughs> so I don't like liver. I don't like the taste of it. I don't like the texture of it. I love the benefits of it. It is one of the very few foods that I eat and immediately feel the benefits. And I like that. It is my multivitamin. So I take about an ounce and I cut it into tiny, tiny pieces and I block my nose and I swallow it whole. And that is my multivitamin. And then I also take about a quarter cup of kefir, which is fermented dairy. Love. That's my ferment in the morning. So that is what I have for my, um, and then sometimes I'll have, I get raw milk from the farm and I'll have that in my coffee. Sometimes I'll just have black coffee. It usually kind of, like I like to intermittent fast. I'm not dogmatic about it. I'm not stringent about it, but I roughly usually eat between nine and three or four. And the first meal I'll make will be something beefy and eggy. Uh, right now I'm obsessed. I tend to get obsessed with a certain preparation right now. I'm obsessed with ground beef in the air fryer and you just take a block of ground beef and you roughly chunk it so that there's chunks, but there's also like crumbles. Put it in the air fryer for 400 for 12 minutes. Oh my God. The inside's juicy, but the outside's a little crispy and the little nuggets that fell off are extra crispy. And that's what I've been having with like two or three soft boiled eggs. I'll also chop up maybe a steak or whatever, put that in the air fryer and that's breakfast. Then um, that usually will ride me till till about three. And then, you know, I'll take Maverick out for a walk. Maverick eats a raw meat diet. And then I will take him out for like, we usually do three to five miles, come home, work out, do work, see clients. And then I'll eat again around three. And that is usually either more ground beef <laughs> or a steak, or I usually have, especially now in the winter, I almost always have a roast in the oven. I put the roast in at like four in the morning and then that will sit on the stovetop and Pascal can munch on that. Then Pascal will eat off the roast. He likes burgers. Um, he likes eggs and sausage. He might cook himself an egg sandwich. He does eat more carbohydrates and he does eat bread. There's no bread without seed oils. There is 365 Whole Foods bagels. Don't have seed oils. That's the only bread product they have that's no seed oils. And then I make some sourdough. I usually make him some bread, some biscuits, some sandwiches, uh, sandwich bread, something like that. Um, he will have pasta. I make that. Uh, and he might have rice if he wants it. But then he'll kind of cook his own food. Like right now he's at work. He works at a barbecue joint. So he'll eat at work. One of the things I love about eating this way is there's zero meal prep. I just love it. It's super simple. So if you just focus on protein, fat, and produce, you could make a nice meal with 
you know, whatever vegetables you enjoy, your protein, your fat, and then maybe a little fruit on the side, and it can be a lovely meal. It's up to you, you know, about what you do for, for starches. Again, Pascal loves potatoes. I keep mashed potatoes in the fridge. I am not a moderate person, so I don't like the all things in moderation for me, but I do believe in it for kids. I think we can have that, you know, if we, if we do it correctly and don't overdo all the crap. And I think it, if we do this with real food, again, I don't think sugar is the devil. I think eating homemade pies uh, after Sunday dinner is wonderful. Making your own ice cream, like these things can be wonderful family traditions. And I think that we've always had treats and always wanted a treat. And I love that as long as we stay, um, as long as it's not all that highly palatable, all those other sugars, all those food dyes, all those seed oils, like your average granola bar is just a chemical shitstorm. So if we stay in the real food range, it's very easy to have things in moderation, I think, including, you know, a pie or a cake or something like that. So I'll make him some sort of dessert that he'll feed off for the week. I've also literally <laughs> read every um, label in Whole Foods and I will buy him for treats, uh, Uncle Tony's chocolate. Not only doesn't have palm oil or seed oils, but it also is um, child labor, slave labor free as is 365 chocolate chips and smart sweets, which are a lower sugar gummy, uh, thrive market sells them. And those are not also made without cornstarch. So those are his like candies. And I will usually make some sort of like a sourdough coffee cake, or maybe a sourdough crust pie or cookies or something like that for him with like sort of the ingredients I know and love and trust. (laughs) And so we also I have always had the luxury because I've always homeschooled and because I've, oh, well, I didn't, I didn't homeschool for a year and a half and I've worked from home and we are two people. So for us, we have always had the luxury of eating when we're hungry. And I've always kept a stock fridge of sort of leftovers that can easily be reheated so that he could eat when he was hungry. And I ate what, when I was hungry, which I do consider to be a huge luxury. And if you can take advantage of that, I think it's really wise. I think our hunger signals immediately get fucked up right from the minute we go to preschool or daycare because we start eating on somebody else's schedule. We start listening to other people's cues. We start thinking we have to eat more in case we get hungry because we're not going to be able to have access to food for the rest of the school day. So I am a big proponent of really try to listen to your cues. And I think, I think it gets fucked up right away. <laughs> So Pascal and I do eat different, like, and I understand that that's probably not how you guys eat. Um, We also don't eat, we've never really sat for meals together because the whole point of family meals is connection when everybody's home after a busy day. We, we, oh, we're home all the time together. We're highly connected. We cook together, but we don't necessarily eat together. So I just wanted to point out those differences. So this is tremendously easy for me. I love the no meal prep, but I do understand that you might have a spouse and kids who are looking forward to this meal. And again, I think you can create beautiful recipes and big meals if you want to, but I also think it's nice to have throw a burger on the grill and have some broccoli on the side if that's what you want. You know, I think it can be really simplified. And we take some of the entertainment value out of food, which is also, I think, helpful. I love, I was a foodie. I spent my formative years in San Francisco. I I could have been a sommelier. I knew every wine that went with every dish. I ate at the finest restaurants. I've been to Paris many times and I lived in Paris for a while. And it's, I love food. And I, it's just, I can't have all the richness and all the hyper palatable foods all the time. So I like to keep it kind of chill and then reserve it for the holidays or whatever. And if I'm going to, if I were so inclined to cook a big meal, I would do a charcuterie board with like olives and really good cheeses and cured meats. And that's what I would do. (laughs) And some slave free dark chocolate. Okay. I think I answered all the questions. If there are more questions, I am happy to answer them. I will try to remember to put these books in the show notes. Oh, I did want to mention Boulder Canyon chips. So that was a struggle for us. Pascal loves potato chips and finding a a seed oil free brand, uh, Boulder Canyon. They sell it at Whole Foods and they have a couple of flavors and not fooling myself that it's a health food, but it just doesn't have the seed oil. So I wanted to mention that brand as well. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your feedback. And if I can help any of you, if you guys want to, I don't know, like if you want videos on strength training or anything, if I can help you on your journey in any way, again, 
I want to just be so clear. I don't ever claim to know what feels good in your body. I do think it's always wise to go in the direction of questioning everything. It's just, I hate that we're at a place in our society, but corporate greed has just taken over everything. I think all of this is just greed with the pharmaceutical companies, with big food, with the big corporate foods, with the whitewashing, you know, with the process now, heart healthy, plant based chemical shit shows. I think people are just really getting tricked. And so I just want you to be aware, question everything. Don't get crazy about it. Don't be dogmatic. And just know that things change too. Like I know a lot of people who experience great healing on 30 days of carnivore and then are totally able. They did like a reset, like a factory reset. And they're able to add in things that previously might've bothered them. Likewise, I know many people who go vegan and experience feeling great but then they don't. And then we get stuck in dogma, whatever it is, either extreme keto is a great therapeutic tool. Um, I actually interviewed a blood sugar specialist. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. All of these things can be tools. And if, if you stop feeling good, it's not necessarily that you're doing it wrong. You're messing it up. It might just be time to switch things up. So be fearless in your right to feel good. That's, I think my, my guiding principle is like, I just want to feel good, you know? And even as much as I love to work out and go hard, like I said, this week is yoga, 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 because yeah, my body's just not feeling as bendy as it should, as buttery as it should. (laughs) All right, guys, as always, rock on. I super appreciate you. Again, any questions, comments, concerns, I would love to address. I will do as many follow-up episodes as possible. If you can't tell, I could talk about this forever. All right, rock on. Okay, bye everyone. Just a reminder, if you need additional resources, I have Oh Crap Potty Training. I have Oh Crap, I Have a Toddler. Those books are available everywhere you want to find a book. (laughs) You can also go to my website, jamieglowacki.com, where you can book private sessions with me, buy any of my courses. Those are really geared towards potty training help. And also I'm on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook anymore and I'm not on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, jamie.glowacki, and I do a lot of lives and uh, usually posting a lot of good information. So those are extra resources for you. And as always, rock on. Have an awesome day.